I feel really good today to be here in Algonquin territory. Uh, I am Tunaka Huni Nik Tunaka Husukil Kuknik in Wakil. So I'm Gwen Phillips, I'm from the Tunaka Nation. I am also a Red Arrow woman, Kanuhus Akpashki. And so when we think about data, we think about labels, we think about things that identify people. I'm also 602-0038001, and for those who don't understand that, I have a label given to me by the federal government. That's the Indian Act Registry, and that's the number they have given me. So by knowing how that number works, 0000, we can actually place me down to a spot in Canada where I'm from, where, where my origins are. And so when we think about the power of data, um, I like to actually try to flip it a little bit because in my own understandings and what my elders taught me, the concept of power is actually a spiritual thing for us and it rests very much deeply inside us. And we think about using our power, well, we do that in a very, 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 very careful way because power influences people. Sometimes we don't even understand how we influence people. Just sitting next to people, if you were a powerful individual, your energy can influence that person that's next to you. And so understanding the nature of power, I want to actually talk about the responsibilities that associate with data, the responsibilities of governing, the responsibilities, etc. And so what you see up in there in front of you there, and I'm gonna move this mic a little bit, and I actually might even take it out of this cradle because Gwen likes to dance. <laughs> I'm gonna talk a little bit more about context, and I'll tighten the mic as well, because without having context, data means nothing. Data is just uh, widgets, it's numbers, it's bits and bytes, it's all of those things. But when you bring context to the, to the conversation, it actually becomes something meaningful. And what you see up there in all of that beautiful imagery and behind there is actually understanding about relationship. So when you think about the Tanakh people, when you think about any any when we understand ourselves, Indigenous people in Canada, and globally, we understand ourselves because we've been placed in a particular place. So when I know myself as the Tanakh, I understand myself because of the creation story we have. The creation story for the Tanakh people actually places us in a particular place. It acknowledges the language that's been given to us. It acknowledges what our relationships will be with all of the creations that are around us. Right there, fundamentally understanding that it's all about responsibilities that bring privilege to us. And so when we think about relationships, again, we understand as a human, we have four cells, and we sometimes don't understand the cells that we contain in ourselves. And so we have relationship struggles internally. And so the intellect, the self that sits in our head right here, and in fact, in the Tunaka language, if I say, and if I ask you to think about something, I'm not asking you to use this part of yourself. I'm asking you to engage this. A kishwe for us is our heart. So if I'm asking you to think about something, I'm asking you, how does your heart feel? Not what does your head think, okay? So our intellectual self is connected to our spiritual self that rests here and our emotional self in our stomach. You get love butterflies. You get ulcers when you're sick. It's all that emotional self resting here. And then our physical vessel that holds it all together. And so we do sometimes have our own internal strugg struggles with relationship. We understand that what we are today is just one, one example of, 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 of a being. When I think about myself, I place myself immediately within a familial context, within a relational context, from a community, from a family. And so the name I have, Red Arrow Woman, actually descends from that man you see sitting in the chair there, who was my great grandfather, who 100 years ago was in Ottawa as well, speaking similar messages. Please recognize us. We are a nation of people. We relate to other people. We are the people of this, this country, Canada. And no matter how you dress us, no matter what labels you give us, we are the Tunaka. And that's him again up there on that visit to Ottawa. So it doesn't matter. He's the one with the nice hat there on the bottom, right, right there. <laughs> It doesn't matter what the outside looks like, it's what's on the inside that matters, where his heart rests. It doesn't matter what you do to him. And so the concept there about being community-driven and nation-based, a lot of people don't understand that what we're dealing with, 602-00380, I used to be a 603. 602, 603. No, I didn't actually change or get better or worse or anything. 602 is one Tanaka community. 603 is a different Tanaka community. I'm an immigrant in my own nation, basically. But they've enumerated us that way by individual Indian bands. Indian bands were extended family groups of people that lived together. We didn't stay inside that community or we would have become 
weak people. We have stories that go back thousands and thousands of years that tell us how to behave, that tell us how to relate. And a lot of people don't understand the diversity of the indigenous population of Canada. There's 11 indigenous language families in Canada that break down into approximately 60 individual linguistically identifiable groups. Those are the nations of Canada, not 640 Indian bands. That's what the government has, has identified us as. We've had many more communities that existed prior to contact, and we have less communities now because smallpox took us away. Half and half again is what our elders say. And so this is a map of British Columbia, one of the provinces of Canada. And in that province, we have seven of the 11 indigenous language families of Canada. Anybody here been to British Columbia? Beautiful, lots of mountains, lots of rivers. Like, like it's, it's a tough country. It's tough land to be in, okay? And that's why we have such diversity of people. Because if you didn't have to climb that mountain, you didn't climb that mountain. If you had what you needed where you were, you stayed there. And in fact, because our creation stories born us from a country, we pretty much stayed there because we saw ourselves and we still see ourselves as stewards of that particular country, that land. I know that territory as mine because in my language, I have stories that attach to all of those places, okay? <laughs> When I taught First Nation Studies at the College of the Rockies, the first thing I did was introduce a concept of record keeping into the Tanaka way. And this is common to many indigenous societies. A string calendar, just a long string that you put little knots in, you put little manipulatives in, so you understand what time has meant to you. Okay? My great grandfather, the hereditary chief, he was a timekeeper. He had a big buckskin ball and he could unwind that ball and tell you the history of my nation. That's data. Each one of those little elements in there was a data mark, okay? And he could recount that story to you. And so when I told my students, you're not gonna have a written exam, you're having an oral exam at the end of this. Oh my gosh, you should have seen the 30 odd students in the class, small college of the Rockies. <gasps> But when they came, when they came to that exam and they started to tell me what they learned, unraveling that ball of their own, that string of their own, blew themselves away how much they could actually remember. Not by the words, but because that string meant something to them. Each thing they put in there was a point at which they recounted something they learned. And they unwound that string and they got excited about what they could recall because it meant something to them. It meant nothing to anybody else. And one of those students said, I'm making one of these for calculus. <laughs> so again, we expect in this time of recognition, in this time of reconciliation, we do not expect the Canadian government to recognize us. We do not expect any of the newcomers to recognize us. They cannot do that. They don't know who we are. We have to tell them who we are. We recognize each other. Where I'm from, I recognize the Shekwemk people, I recognize the Sioux people, I recognize the Blackfoot and Blood people, because those are the neighbors around me. Thousands of years of relationship, we recognize each other. And we recognize the Métis people as the real Canadians, the first Canadians, really. Indigenous people, a foreign mix, that's a Canadian. The Métis language, that should be called the Canadian language, because all of our languages are indigenous languages. I have a subtle joke. What's the difference between the inherent right, indigenous rights, and aboriginal rights? At least nine months. <laughs> so we understand that there is a subtle relationship difference between ourselves as indigenous people and the Métis population as an aboriginal group of Canada. And in my own nation, we've reconciled that difference. We've come to recognize that. And so Métis people take services from my nation. My nation provides services on and off reserve to all Aboriginal people, regardless of status or residency. Because our title is such that it belongs to all of us as Dunaka, living, deceased, and in the future. So we have to pretty much understand that our responsibility is a stewardship responsibility to ensure that seven generations down the road, they're gonna have at least what we have now, which is a real challenge because I see this trajectory for the world that's not such a good one for myself in understanding what my values are and understanding what my interests are. And so jurisdiction, as we know, it can be personal, it can be territorial, you can govern over land, govern over people. And so Métis people have territorial? No, they have personal jurisdiction. They did not have a land base prior to coming here. Yes, they have some fee simple and settlement lands, but it's different than having actual a title, a broader title. And that title is not a fee simple title. It's not something I can sell because I hold it in trust for the seventh generation in front of me. And so when we sit at a treaty table in this modern concept, in this modern age, and we say, because British Columbia is negotiating treaties, 
And they say, you know, you got to extinguish your rights and title. And we're going, no, we can't do that. I do not have the authority to do that. It's really difficult for people to understand because British common law caught it, brought us some concepts which were so foreign to us, fundamentally foreign to us. For example, marriage law, okay? When we met the, the, the newcomers and they brought this concept of marriage law, property law, you know that, right? Hmm? Men own their women and their minor children. You know? Well, ladies, in our world, in the Tanakh Aksmaknik, Women owned everything. We were the decision makers. We owned the camp. We made all the decisions in the camp. We owned everything in the camp. The men protected and provided for the camp. We knew how to work. And male, female, it wasn't a gender role like that. It was job specific, functional, okay? We, there were women warriors and there were men who stayed in camp. We didn't decide who should do what, but you had to do something. It was about responsibility. So we all know that we have responsibility that brings privilege. So this concept of rights and freedoms, again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a funny concept, it's a lovely concept, but I don't I really believe in it, okay? Yes, we have rights. I have the right to say, and once I say that, everything I do is a responsibility to bring a privilege. For me to actually be able to say in 10 years, I have to keep repeating that. I have to believe that. I have to be that. I can't just give it lip service. And so these are the languages in British Columbia. These are the indigenous languages of British Columbia, over 30 languages. We have the most diversity of all of Canada. And when you understand the geography, you know why, okay? So we want recognition as we recognize each other and ourselves. We want recognition from the Crown federally. And we also need to understand we have a relationship with the provincial, territorial, and other governments that exist. So I've heard somebody say something about grounding, grassroots, grassroots, and I love that because in my own language, akokpokam, akokpokam means anything that literally takes its life from the earth, like roots that detach and take its life. Akokpokam nam. I've added a suffix nam onto that. That literally means your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. It's your legacy, your human legacy. When you understand our language, you know how to behave, you know responsibility, you know how to govern because governing for us comes from the ground up. From the ground up, from our values, from our connection to our earth and all of those stories. And then our government institutions better darn well live top down. But right now it's kind of skewed. It's like the power is held in the government at the top and they force it down rather than understanding that it's an organic thing that comes from the ground for us. That we have a long term, long term vision we've got to set for ourselves. And so some of you as researchers have may have seen some research done by Harvard. They've looked at, uh, in the 1980s, a lot of research looking at the successful indigenous nations, actually the tribes, Indian tribes, in the United States. So it's a very different history in the United States than Canada. The US conquered the indigenous nations, right? set them up on reserves, under constitutions. So the American Indians mostly have constitutions that almost speak to what the American constitution speaks to, power of government. There we go with that nasty word again. Power makes people get pretty big chested and puff up. And in fact, when we see what the power of government has done to many of these societies that are actually don't have a lot of power, it's not a good thing. Power without responsibility brings a lot of corruption, chaos, and a lot of room for craziness to occur. So in this project, this research project, they looked at successful indigenous nations across the United States, and these factors came up across these nations that were common in those that were more successful than others. So the de facto self-government, actually having enough sovereignty or enough power to make your own decisions. We live under an Indian Act in Canada. They tell me who I am and they tell me how to act and people don't even know that the land I live on is federal land held in trust by Her Majesty the Queen for the use and occupation of status Indians. So I paid my mortgage to CMHC, but I don't get a fee simple title. I get a certificate of possession. Her Majesty the Queen is going to let me possess that house that resides on her land. So when we think about jurisdiction and disputes, the federal government has federal land that we get to live on, and then the provinces and territories have jurisdiction over a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't extend on reserve. Okay, oh, mm, escape, always escape. There's always an escape button. And so again, when we came to realize that we were sort of in this, in this funny position with having not a lot of power and authority, 
And then we came to understand, oh my gosh, but you do have a lot of power and authority because your power and authority is inherent. It does not come from the Constitution of Canada. It does not come from any other government giving it to you. But they'd convinced us that over the history of having us in residential schools and other places. When we came to really understand ourselves again, we said, oh, hey, no wonder this is going on the way it's been going. We've been listening to them. We've been trying to get rid of problems in our communities. We've been trying to find problems because guess what? There was even a published document called the Indian problem. And if you go back through history, you're gonna see that we were nothing but a problem. When in fact, now they're coming to understand, my gosh, some of these people have some solutions. So years ago, years ago, when I started to look at where my nation wanted to go, because I descend from hereditary leaders that are responsible for governance. My job with my nation is governance transition. And so years ago, when I saw what the other governments were doing and how they worked, I'm like, way, no wonder. And so what did we do? We looked for opportunities to do things differently. And in fact, one of the mantras we have is try differently, not harder, okay? Seriously, <laughs> we're gonna look at talk about that this morning, giggle, giggle. So we use appreciative inquiry for everything, everything. There's always something good. In fact, our elders tell us there's not enough to nacha to throw even one away. So we have these social safety nets we put together because, oh gosh, there's certain people that can't take care of themselves. Baloney! Everybody can do something for themselves. And in fact, if you are somebody with a, a less than full capacity, probably are have a full capacity somewhere else, maybe even over full, okay? So sometimes the, the labels we put on people and how we define people are against something. So we're analyzing somebody against something, some normalized standard somewhere, when in fact, the only thing we should be doing is looking in the mirror. Every one of us should be looking in the mirror. So the Canadian government has tried to use big data to look at big problems, when in fact, we have small problems in small communities. And when we do things differently, those problems start to disappear. In the early 1990s, we worked with the University of British Columbia. I was a director of education for my nation. I had broke the master tuition agreement, which was this federal provincial tuition payment thing. We used to watch the plane fly from Ottawa to BC with all this money on it over to Victoria. And we had no ability to actually relate to our local governments, our local communities, our local school districts as indigenous people living on the reserve. Feds would pay for us when we went to school in town. We'd ride the bus, get off, go back to town. So we were just consumers of their system. We weren't participants necessarily, and because we didn't pay taxes in town, we didn't have the same voice. Then I read policy. Policy said for every status Indian student normally residing on reserve and attending a public school as of September 30th, a tuition fee, ah, policy wonk. Read the policy, use the policy for every status Indian student normally residing on reserve September 30th. Okay, we just won't let them be there then. So we kept our kids out of school in September in a community program sent them to school in October, and had the school district crying out, where's our money? We said, huh, where's our education? Because up until that point, our children were not given a decent education. Our children were really used as numbers to get money. They weren't looked at as people. And because we had challenges with education, and when we did this research project, we came, ah! what we determined was we had over 40% fetal alcohol affected individuals. Because when you understand Canadian history, and I beg of you from other places, please do a little research and understand what our history has been like. Residential schooling up until 1970 in my neck of the woods. Okay? You know what we did? We turned our residential school into a four star hotel, golf course, transformation. We didn't knock it down, it wasn't the bricks and mortar, it was the working of the machinery inside the bricks and mortar. So we healed our nation. Community healing and intervention. Mother, how do you feel when you know you caused brain damage in your child because you drank when you were pregnant? A lot of people didn't realize. Our doctors used to say, hey, take a shot of this. It'll help your milk come in, or do this or do that. That was the kind of advice we were given. What we didn't know then, we know now. Data, information, stories, people, lives. In those early 1990s when we did that research project, these people, my cousins, these children were research subjects to the principal researcher from UBC. I didn't realize, I didn't understand the concept of research, I didn't understand archiving data and how long it was held for and all of those things. So now as adults, 
Those children who were fetal alcohol spectrum disorder identified as children want to know about themselves, but that data is not there. Who? So we've got to think differently about data. When data is used and data is empowering people and data is about people, it's about lives, knowing ourselves, relationships, responsibilities. And with history, we know that Indigenous populations across Canada have had very, very different experiences. Over here in this neck of the woods, Royal Proclamation Treaty, 1763. Even prior to that, they had Royal Procl or, or, or treaties. 1867, we had other kinds of arrangements. So we went from a, 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 a Royal Proclamation into a British North America Act, into the Constitution Act of Canada, and we saw us being called different things, but the fundamental relationship hadn't changed over history, and it still really hasn't changed. They're still telling us they're gonna change us. We're all gonna be indigenous now, because they don't understand. We even understand we're not all indigenous in Canada. They just think they can change the label, another label. Do you wanna know how many labels I've had in my life? A lot, but I like the best. So over history, we realize that our communities, indigenous communities across Canada are at our different places because some of us have only had 100 years of exposure to this new way of doing things, where others are two or 300 years of, of relationship. So in my neck of the woods, I have a 94-year-old auntie, the granddaughter of the gentleman you saw there, my mentor, my granddaughter's in succession training now, and so we understand what our responsibility is, is to continue to move ourselves through time. And so time for Indigenous people is not a linear point thing. I talked about that. It's like an ever-evolving spiral. And people say we do things in a circular motion. Yes. But if you go in a circle too many times, you know what you do? You create a rut. It's actually an evolving spiral. Every time you move past, you can look back and reflect where you came from, and there's always a future. It's a reminder, always a past and always a future. You can't leave your past behind, nor should you. Oh, let's just forget about that, and that didn't work. No, let's f learn from that, that didn't work. So we have to try differently, not harder. So as we realize that we've gotta do things differently, we've gotta support people where they are. As the indigenous nations across Canada, no one size fits all. We've gotta be recognized as individual nations. The Tanukha nation wants to know about the Tanukha nation and measure myself against myself as a nation. I don't want to be measured against the Mi'kmaq, but the data that's available to the federal government right now, because they can't get down to the ground where I am, is big data, big purposes. It's dipstick data, is what I call it, right? Monkey on the termite hill, dipstick data. Five years later, dipstick, no data, no termites. And that's fine, you know, we gotta we got do it. But what happened? Why are there no termites? You've got a five year period there between these dipstick events. We are not sure what happened. Then you gotta do real research. What happened? Well, how about we just do real research as we're moving along? Apply it every day. Don't think of data and research as something that you do every now and then. We do it every day and we need access to do it every day because we are community development and nation rebuilding in that mode. And we need data from all sorts and all sources. And so back in, ooh, what year was that? I can't remember. I know it was around the year 2000. I worked with Sierra Systems, a big data development firm, to build a data warehouse. I was one of the first people in Canada to think about a data warehouse. I was like doing cutting edge stuff. And I know nothing about data. I'm a governance wonk. I'm a tenacha smuckinik. I know about relationships. I know how to tell stories. But that whole field of data and what they thought of it, it was like a whole other world. And I'm going, no, 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 come with me. And so they helped me create this data warehouse. What we, we called it Crimson, Comprehensive Resource and Information Management System for Indigenous Nations, to bring data from all different places into one common environment. Go figure, the human in the middle, education data, employment data, health data. Oh gosh, now I'm seeing a picture emerge. Now the data has context because data without context is damaging or potentially is damaging, okay? One little, two little, three little people. They say by Census Canada that there's a hundred and some fluent speakers of the Dunaha language left. They identify a hundred and some fluent speakers. I think it was 150 something in one of the reports recently. 
and we're looking for them still. So if any of you are fluent enough as speakers, please put your hand up, because we can only find 35. We can only find 35. It's very important to us to rebuild our language, because in our language is all the things we need to know how to live. Our relationships are there. Our traditional ecological knowledge is there. You know what? Our stories are there that allow us to live well. I brought a team of epigeneticists from UBC. So we still have a relationship with UBC. I brought them over to home and I said, elders, I need you to come and meet with these scientists. So we brought a bunch of the technical people there too. I'm like, okay, epigeneticists, go. They did their thing. I'm like, okay, elders, we didn't bring them here to teach us anything, right? They're like, no. Just to validate what we already know. So they were talking about the impact on the genome at the developing fetus and how experiential things going on could affect that baby's development. That if you're exposed as an infant to a lot of trauma, maybe you have famine, maybe you have neglect, abuse, things going on and what you're developing inside that you can potentially and more than likely will have inflammatory disease later on in life. Heart disease, diabetes, hey, trends emerging. I'm looking at indigenous populations in Canada. Oh my gosh, have you looked at our health statistics lately? And have you looked at the correlation between toxicity from mold and mental wellness? Because there's a direct correlation there too. Now go into some of our communities and look at some of the housing conditions because there are no provincial standards on reserve for housing. So it's any man for any woman, any, just go. So again, when we think about what our responsibilities are right now as indigenous nations, we are rebuilding institutions. No, we're not looking to just do government. We need to do governance. We need to rebuild from the ground up to re-energize our values as indigenous peoples, to reconnect with our languages so we can become the unique individual nations we are. Because over here in the Algonquin territory is very different people than the Danaka people. And have any of you been to the coastal areas of Vancouver and all up and down there? Wow, totem poles, big massive masks. The culture there is phenomenal. I'm a TP gal, okay? People from BC, oh, you're all totem pole. No, I'm a TP gal. In fact, we've got two types of TP. So we have to rebuild our nation based on who we are. And this is my, no, I'm not, a, I'm not an academic. I'm not a learned person. I'm a ground raised gal. But this is my PhD. Those posters that you just saw there, uh, 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 those ones. I've got a few sets here I'm gonna leave with Tracy and she can decide where they go. But in there basically is instruction to the federal government. This is what we mean when we talk about nation to nation relationships. This is what we mean when we talk about nation rebuilding. And this is what we need when we talk about how about we invest in nations instead of putting out grants and contributions. Because when you talk about investing in something, you expect to see a return on it. When you give you somebody a grant or a contribution, it's like, that was nice. So we expect a whole different relationship there. And I said to Treasury Board, Treasury Board, you know, if you recognize the 60 indigenous nations, you can probably get rid of the 400 or so program authorities you have to relate to us. <laughs> because you'll know who we are. Our focus has got to be shifting environments, people. Our job as policymakers is to create good environments. People will grow healthy if the environment is well, okay? But right now, we got ugly environments everywhere. If you go to any of our communities, right? This dorm room here is like, hey, four-star hotel compared to some of the community housing we have. So in understanding our job as policymakers is to shift those environments, the social, economic, and physical environment. But right now, there's this funny thing going on because Indian Affairs has this weird program architecture and it all has these strategic outcomes that are nice, but then it kind of goes inverted and kind of goes internal and crunches itself. And they don't understand when they think about us because in their program architecture, they have governance and people separate, which is really weird for us, but then they have land and economy together, which again is really weird for us. Because land for us is the economy, not to be used separate for, because if you don't have the land as healthy, I already talked about our connection to the land, and it means my grandchildren and great grandchildren, okay? So for us, we can't look at the economy without thinking about the land as separate and its integrity. So we look at ourselves in relation to the land, then we'll determine what the economy can be. 
so that the people and the culture stay well. So it's that spiral evolving out. So when we think about what we want from an economy in Canada, it's not about wealth, because in the Tadakha language, wealth means how many children you have, how many grandchildren you have. It's not about how much money you have. Money without values is not a good thing, okay? So we had in British Columbia, and we had across Canada, residential school payments. Payments for people who went to residential schools and were injured physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. So depending upon what their individual story was, they would be compensated by the federal government for the injuries, mental, physical, emotional, spiritual. And I had an opportunity to meet with the population public health data experts of BC prior to that happening. And I said, excuse me, all you PhDs, how are you planning on measuring the negative impact of those payments on my people? Oh, you think there would be a negative impact? It's money. I said, you've just given bullets to people packing guns. Huh? Uh, don't speak in metaphors, Gwen, tell them. They did not understand that if you are feeling crappy about yourself, that if you've been told you're ugly and stupid and lazy and all of the things that we've been told we are, because there's not been understanding of who we are and the complexities and the understandings of the relationships we have, then that's how you feel. You see a child that's told that, the most brilliant child can be told, you're stupid, and they'll act that way because that's what we demand of them, that's what we tell them. So be careful with our words because words create worlds and appreciative inquiry, that's why we use that concept. Everything we approach in community is something is good, something is good, it's all about being good. We're not living in la-la land, but we recognize that there's always something good in everything. Cup half empty, half full, you know that thing. I do this exercise literally, where I have a smaller cup. <laughs> and I take the half cup and I say, half full or half empty? And I start pouring into the smaller cup and it spills over. Perception, <laughs> what we want, objectives, goals, etc. So this is about our internal economy, supporting an internal economy for indigenous nations so we can be self-sufficient. My nation's vision speaks to self-sufficiency, not wealth. We want to take care of ourselves and each other again. So we've been working through a logical process, vision, Strong, healthy citizens and communities speaking our languages and celebrating who we are and our history and our ancestral homelands. Working together, managing our lands and resources as a self-sufficient, self-governing nation. That's the Tanaka Nation vision statement. Sounds pretty, looks good on a t-shirt, looks lovely on a banner. But unless I can define it and measure it, it's meaningless. So we took a few years. What is a strong, healthy citizen? What is a strong, healthy community? We're putting metrics around that beautiful vision so we can measure it. And believe me, it's not about how many less people have diabetes or how many less people have killed themselves. That's what we're measured on right now as indigenous people. It's easy to do. Youth suicide is one of the measurements they use to see how well we're doing. I'm going, how about we use youth vitality? <laughs> it's a more difficult approach, but actually you're measuring what you want not what you don't want. <laughs> when you go to the bank, you look how much money you have, I hope, not much money you don't have. <laughs> if we jump right over here to the letter of the law and forget about the spirit side of it all, we start regulating to police, we start regulating to control, we forget that we're actually supposed to be regulating to build something, not just to take away or restrict. And so again, appreciative inquiry is so important as we start to say, what is our vision? How am I doing for time there? I don't know these cards flying by me yet there. I'm good? And she's, no, you're good, keep talking, keep talking. They don't know me. <laughs> Grades one and two, I missed over 70 days of school a year, okay? Because when I went there, they said, sit down and shut up, Gwen. <laughs> but, but that child needs help, I could help them. Sit down and shut up, Gwen, that's not how this place works. Social responsibility is so important. Collaborative learning is so important. Complexity theory demands that all these brilliant brains work together. But that's not necessarily how our institutions have been training us. Our institutions train that way. But when I went to that other school, they said, sit down, shut up, Gwen, and do not look over your shoulder. I learned how to read upside down and backwards really well. <laughs> because I'm inquisitive, I want to know. I want to know. And so that vision, again, is so important to us because vision 
brings people together. Vision makes people want that. I want that. So communications and marketing, darn toot and create that vision. Make it sexy. Who would ever figure data could be sexy? I've been accused of making data sexy. So again, my community's vision inside of my nation's vision, because both are different. The nation needs to protect the language and do all of those things that are critical to the Dinaha nation. But there's more than one community that belong to the Dinaha nation. So they need their own vision. They need their own action. They need to know what they are defining and describing for themselves. So again, they can measure the future. This cube, and I always go, there we go, the box, the cube, the whatever, a UN cube, sort of looking at this population health concept and looking at health promotion. But again, if we think about the population as a global indigenous population, it's not going to do us very well in Canada. And that's the way they like to do things, because that's the easy way. We've actually got to understand, as I've mentioned and introduced, that each nation has to be considered as an individual population for concerning ourselves with population health and wellness. So that when we're measuring on a population level, we're measuring the Tanakha against the Tanakha, the Tsimshan against the Tsimshan, the Mi'kmaq against the Mi'kmaq, so that we actually are, respective of, are respectful of the individual cultural nuances, the differences in our cultures and our languages. Because if we think of an indigenous population as a global population, and we say, okay, all you Europeans are all the same. No, I don't think so. And that's what people have come to believe in Canada, that indigenous people are just like a big blanket of global people. And it's like, no, very fundamental values that are similar because we've lived here a long time and it wasn't like, you know, we had to create some elbow room for common law amongst each other. And in fact, my great grandpa, the one you saw up there as a younger fella, had to go over the mountains in the middle of winter from BC over to Alberta where the Blackfoot camp was near Waterton and tell him, okay, we'll bring your horses next spring so we don't fight anymore because when the buffalo were eradicated from the prairies, there were millions of buffalo in Canada, all across the prairies. We had so much damn food in this country, we could have probably fed the globe. What did they do? Killed them off, Prrr, systematically. Sent the furs someplace, let the carcasses just rot. Okay? That's the way we think. We got lots of this, let's just use it up. Caution humans. At least seven generations, please. When I heard the finance minister a couple of ministers ago say, oh, we won't worry about that. We'll leave the deficit for our grandchildren. Hooray! I almost fell flat on my face. He actually said that on TV? How would we ever give our grandchildren that legacy? No. We've got to make sure we're building. And I say, let's not do cubes anymore. Let's do baskets. Because baskets, you're flexible. You can weave things in all the time. Cubes and boxes and such are really rigid. And I did this thing one time, I was speaking at a conference uh, around OCAP, Ownership, Control, Access, and Possession of Data. And I said, you know, it was a room full of researchers. I said, this is how it's for us. It's like a dice. Picture that literally, a dice laying in the middle of your table there. And so you could see everybody visualizing the dice. And I said, so you guys in the hard sciences, you're on one spot, and you over there, and you're on the other spot, and you over there, you're on the other spot. And every time you think you're only seeing one flat surface of that plane, that cube has got how many sides on a cube? Six, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, two, three, yeah, the dice. And then I went, you're all looking at it from one perspective, and any time you do that, as long as it's laying there on the table, one side's always hidden. But guess what? I did a big jump. I'm in the middle. It's a solid thing. Inside that dice is where the real stuff is. And all you're doing is looking at it from one side. Oh, I think this. Well, let's get inside and really know this. So in BC, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but British Columbia First Nations, and I'm one of the First Nations Health Council members. Of course, if there's anything going on, Gwen's gonna be there. Gwen's gonna be the nosy girl. We took over Health Canada's Inuit health branch. So they used to have First Nations Inuit health branches in all provinces and territories. BC had First Nations Inuit health branch. And they delivered health services for First Nations people, or tried to, from Ottawa, from a BC region branch. Policy in Ottawa, BC region branch. We went, this don't work so well. We kind of don't, don't, don't really get the best of everything over here. Let's do differently. So I don't know if you know this, but there was a, an attempt at a real big uh, uh, agreement way back when that was going to be called the Kelowna Accord. 
It was when Paul Martin was in government. He was ready to sign up for almost what we're doing here again. I think we had a little flashback to another similar party or something like that. Anyway, what Paul Martin agreed to was really to look at a nation-to-nation -nation relationship and a lot of self-government uh, uh, sort of concepts. And then we had a change in government, and then it went down. But BC First Nations said, no, 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 no. We're not letting this go. And so we took over a federal branch of government. First Nations in British Columbia now operate the First Nations Inuit Health Branch for the federal government, for our own people. So I sit on the governance arm, and we separate governance and business. So we have a board that delivers the services, and that board is comprised of brilliant people that know how to run things, like women at Children's Hospital, former directors, etc. So they're running our services for us. And a couple of weeks ago, we met with the deputy minister and said, how's it going there, Simon? He said, you know what? If anybody asks me, is this a success? I'll say yes, because I don't get any calls from cranky Indians in BC anymore. <laughs> I get a few. No, I don't. Because we do things very differently. We're actually starting now to look at doing things differently, measuring things differently. Last year, after two rounds of engagement across the province, we started to shift the indicators from what I call the ugly seven, which we inherited when we took over this health branch, suicide, infant mortality, I talked about those things, we're now shifting them to indicators of well-being. So we will be measuring from a cultural lens things that make sense to people. And I just want to, one thing there before I leave there. This address, bcfndgi.com, that's the website for the BC First Nations Data Governance Initiative where you'll find those posters en anglais, en français aussi, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of things we've developed over the years to help shift people's minds on what needs to be measured and how it needs to be measured and why it needs to be measured. So a lot of people don't think about what are you going to evaluate, what are you going to measure when you're making plans. We just go ahead and plan, 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 plan. And then you come almost to the end of your project and you go, oh gosh, we ought to evaluate this thing. Let's put an evaluation plan into place. We go, no, 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 no. You've got to decide that right off the bat. What are you measuring? Why are you even doing this? Because when you set your objectives, you should know what they're trying to achieve there. So planning and evaluation go hand in hand. I had a lady from somewhere overseas say, oh, I was trying to do this appreciative inquiry evaluation. I said, did you do an appreciative inquiry plan? She said, no. I said, oh, how did it work for you? She said, it was really hard. I said, that's why. You square boxed it, you tried to turn it into a basket and it didn't quite work well. She said, yeah, I kind of realized that. I got to do it differently next time. Yeah, try differently, not harder. So we expect to look at what those indicators are and to have the data available to us in the community. But again, right now, we don't have administrative data systems that come to us from the federal government. We get a policy manual. Here's your policy. Here's your contribution agreement. It'll come. Oh, heaven forbid, don't forget to file that report for the $2,500 you got grant because you won't get the other money, okay? So the relationship we have with the federal crown is really broken. And we'll never get the outcomes we expect out of the relationship we have right now. So we gotta do differently here. We gotta set the goals and objectives for ourselves. They've gotta provide us with inputs, but they gotta stay heck out of the way of a lot of things. And so this is an example of their program architecture. They're working on a treasury board, okay? And I'm going, how about we replace those things within each nation? So each nation is a core responsibility. How about because you've got infrastructure across Canada, each regional operation actually becomes nation-based governance transition teams instead of program managers. Guess what? Overnight, flip the switch. Same people. You've now got nation-to-nation -nation relationships. So I drafted a one-pager for the JT, as he's affectionately known here in Canada. I didn't get to hand it to him. I handed it to somebody to hand to him. But the one-pager said, Nation-to-nation -nation relationships, five strategic steps with no new funding. All it required was a few different approaches. Take the headquarters policy shop, break it up and give each region a piece of it. So they can actually deal with the reality of the people in that region because BC and Nova Scotia are very different. So stop the cookie cutter, stop the architecture and put people in there. Let relationships exist, and we'll see how different the outcomes are when people are relating to people and not defending a program and a spending authority. Again, what are we trying to achieve? What is the data for? How are we measuring it? Let's just transform this relationship a little. Ha, ah, ha, ah, let us define the outcomes. Let us report on those outcomes to our own people to each other and to the world. 
Yes, when we think about schools again, all of these beautiful children, all of those things affect those children's lives. Yet do we consider those things when the child's in school? No. You want to know how many of our children come to school hungry? They can't think. How many of our children come to school because their houses are in horrible shape? They can't think. So we've got to know that we've got to be investing strategically and making sure that we've got right information systems in the right places to be accountable. Because we're accounting for not just money, we're accounting for people's lives. So right now there's a bunch of national strategies, a lot of energy at headquarters going on, nation to nation, JT says it, make it happen. So without a real plan, people are going, oh my God, you make it happen. No, you make it happen. What are you doing? Who's the nations? I don't know. So I'm going, okay, we'll help you. We will help you. There's a community development framework that's been emerging. And last week I was here in Ottawa and I went, yeah, let's get this baby out there. Because it recognizes community development and nation rebuilding both have to happen. It recognizes that indigenous nations were strong and healthy for thousands of years. That's a recognition statement, okay? Then we need to attach that fiscal framework to it because if the fiscal framework's over here and the action's over here, <laughs> yeah, wrong. You're not gonna be able to account for the outcomes with the money, okay? They've gotta be connected. And then we need a collaboration framework because there's all kinds of busyness, all kinds of entities, all kinds of partners. So each nation defines who it is they need to work with. The Danuka Nation, we've got MOUs, LOUs, and IOUs with anybody who'll talk. So we have done nation rebuilding. We provide services to everybody, and guess what? We have surpassed mainstream graduation rates with Aboriginal population in the public schools in my neck of the woods because of having intensive work in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, because of doing intensive community development work. Did you hear me, people? We've surpassed mainstream graduation rates, Aboriginal people in my neck of the woods. That's huge. You're not clapping for me. You're clapping for the fact that change can happen. Change is possible. Reality of today doesn't have to be the reality of tomorrow if we put our minds to it. So each nation is basically now taking on that responsibility. But because we don't have direct investments, we depend on partnerships. So work with us. So the institutions that are in our territories need to work with us, not do things for us, not things to us, but work with us so we can work and do things for ourselves. Transition, impart those skills upon us. And please don't always expect us to come and get a degree before we can be active and be doing things with you. I don't have a degree. I could never get that much time out of community to get <coughs> educated. Yeah, I'm, I'm educated, but not that educated. So we're building those institutions, rebuilding, not nation building. And that's another thing the elders told me. Gwen, you want to rebuild or are you going to build your own So it's the understanding that we're not building from scratch. We're rebuilding. And so this year, because we're at this very critical time in understanding, we've got to tell our own stories. We cannot let you tell our stories any longer, Canadian government. This is now nation to nation. And in doing so, we need to reset the relationship. We need to reset the understandings. And so I'm a party crasher, by the way. You can see, Gwen, this isn't really your usual data presentation, right? So at the IODC summit in 2015, I was a party crasher. I don't know if any of you were there. But we said to Treasury Board, who's opening this international data summit where you're inviting the G20s, inviting the world? Which name? Is it the Algonquin going to be there and open it? And I look, no. There was no Indigenous people invited to that event from Canada. We went, that's not a good thing, Canada, <laughs> especially in this day and age. So like, okay, this is a month before the summit. So we worked with them, got an international panel together, participated in the event, because Gwen said, I'll welcome the world inside or I'll welcome the world outside. <laughs> and since that day, Treasury Board and Indigenous Affairs has actually become a little bit more friendly and a little more understanding, and they're working with us in supporting this transition of relationship. So this year, we've got a couple of papers that we've been working on as Gwen's work beyond BC, across Canada, and internationally with my Indigenous friends from around the world. We have common issues, common understandings, and common visions, really, with respect to taking ownership over ourselves again, because identity is everything. 
and anything that attaches to our identity as indigenous people. If it's the Danaka language, if it's Danaka songs, if it's Danaka stories, the Canadian intellectual property law does not protect that. So we together are going to insert, we're going to assert data sovereignty. So anything that attaches to our identity as indigenous nations, that indigenous nation is the owner. The Danaka nation has a challenge with the Canadian intellectual property laws because the Danaka language is not protected by those laws. Anybody can abuse it. And in fact, there's a, a Nupika Adventures tourism kind of a little back country thing going on up in our neck of the woods. Some non-Indigenous group like that word because it's easy to say in our language, but Nupika is a very important spirit to us. It's like if you put Jesus Christ uh, uh, adventure tourisms, right? Something like that. When we ask them, please change it, it's not appropriate. We'll even find a better word for you, a more appropriate word for it. They're like, no, we're all branded now. It's like, but, but, so we thought we'll go and check, check with the government. Can we get a law around it? No, no, they've, they've, it's theirs now. We're like, it's theirs now? Yeah, they've copywritten it. It's theirs. They've got a trademark on it. Whoa. So without us actually taking every word, every song, every story, and protecting it under Canadian intellectual property law, it's free for all. And again, data, words, stories, create relationships. So we're also got a project underway where we're, that one's defining a little bit. I'm hoping you're reading some of that stuff that's behind me there. I'm going to speak to it a lot, but we're defining the relationship on data. So who owns the data? Who's going to control the data? And then looking at it here, trying to reset who the nations are so Canada can get a better understanding. We're not expecting them to do it. We'll help it, help make it happen. So I'm working with BC First Nations, Alberta working with Alberta nations, Saskatchewan with their own nations, et cetera, understanding that some of the nations go across many provinces, the Cree nation, the, the, the Dene nation, et cetera, many provinces because those lines weren't there before, right? That's a Canadian thing. We didn't have Indian cartographers. In fact, when they drew a line on a map, we tripped over it. So now what we want to do is we want to put our stories back to the map. So this open government plan in Canada now has our little bit of recognition, and it's now talking about having to work with us a little bit, engage as we move forward. So expression of data sovereignty and an international level. These slides are here. They'll be part of the, the, the uh, wrap-up information, and you'll be able to Google these sites to see who we're working with internationally because this is our thinking. Dacha.